We're going to start this topic of boosting and ensembles today. Uh, I'll talk about it a bit. I'll introduce like the key idea, and then uh, we'll wrap it up um, in somewhere in the middle of the next uh, lecture. So the question that uh, I'll talk about is what is boosting? I'll introduce this idea of uh, this algorithm called Adaboost, which was designed to answer a certain theoretical question and also have some cool practical properties and then use Adaboost to uh, introduce this idea of ensembling. There's a good chance that I'll probably get done with this today. Uh, boosting is a general strategy for constructing a strong learner using a collection of weak learners, possibly an infinite number of them. Um, it, it has a nice sort of a historical uh, uh, story. Um, it was it, it was a concrete constructive answer by Rob Shapir to a particular question that came up because of uh, pack learnability. Uh, and we'll talk about that question in a bit. Turns out boosting is also practically useful because it's one way of uh, combining a collection of rules of thumb into a classifier. And it's a special case, it's an instance of something called an ensemble. An ensemble is a really important technical tool that you need to have in your toolkit. It's, it, it's a very uh, natural idea. Rather than building, rather than letting your learning algorithm produce one classifier, imagine that your learning algorithm produces a committee of classifiers, a set of them. So each of those makes a decision. You know, you're given a new example, your entire committee makes a decision on that classifier, on that instance. And then you somehow combine those decisions to construct one consensus. This is called an ensemble. So uh, uh, ensembling classifiers uh, is, in general, it's a good idea. It's a good sort of a production idea. At any point you want to build a model, think about it, think about constructing an ensemble of that model because it can lead to more stable uh, predictions. Boosting, it turns out, is a particular type of ensemble that comes with theoretical guarantees uh, of a particular nature. In particular, it comes with uh, pack type guarantees. I'm going to use this example. Uh, and this example is definitely dated. This example is from uh, the original slides that uh, original talk that uh, I think Shapir gave in the 1990s when things like collect call and calling card and such things actually made sense. Um, but since uh, I, I don't want, doesn't want to spoil uh, a good example, I'm going to keep it. Imagine that uh, you have a phone call, you make a phone call, and based on what you say, you are routed to a particular, uh, uh, some, some action happens. So if you say you'd like, I'd like to place a collect call, then the program triggers an action called collect call. I'm not entirely sure what a collect call is, but I'm, so, I'm told that in the uh, dark ages of the 1990s, this was a thing. Uh, you can imagine that you try to make a call and you want to bill that call to a third party. It, call, it triggers a program called third number. If you want to place a call, but pay for it using your MasterCard, um, it triggers a, a program called calling card. So there are these different uh, uh, thing outcomes that can happen based on what you say. And uh, because I have at least three options here, this is an instance of a multi-class classification task. Why? Because the input is some uh, you know, voice command, and the label is one of these programs that has to be uh, triggered. The thing is, it may seem like these things are, this is an easy problem to solve. I can detect certain words. So if the word card shows up in the utterance, then I don't need to worry about other things with high probability. Not with high probability, there's a weak correlation between that and this uh, calling card. So then I can invent these rules of uh, thumb. If the word uh, collect shows up, then it's collect call. So I can, you, know, you can imagine writing these rules of thumb, little Python programs that look at your, um, that, that, that look at this uh, input text and uses some rules to construct these things. Construct, uh, you know, route it appropriately. So this is the kind of thing that you know you might imagine if uh, someone does not know machine learning, this is the kind of program one might write. Now, the goal is, can I 
combine these rules of thumb into a statistically robust program that uh, goes beyond any one of those rules of thumb does. That's the, that's the, that's the task that we are asking from uh, boosting. Well, you can, uh, uh, here is one way to uh, solve the problem. You look at a certain set of examples, you stare hard at it, you invent a rule of thumb. Now you find another set of examples, you stare hard at it, you invent another rule of thumb. You do this p times, you have p little functions that uh, decide to route the, uh, the, the, the input to whichever out, uh, label it should be. Now you have p functions, all of which essentially behave like little classifiers. But these are heuristics. These are rules that you just invented by looking at maybe five examples each time. They're not going to generalize. The idea of boosting is you want to combine all of them into a single prediction rule. Um, in order to do this, we need to think about how to construct a set of examples and how to combine these rules of thumb. And that's what, uh, that, that's a, 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 con, a sort of a constructive answer that the adipose algorithm will tell us. Boosting is a general method that uh, solves this problem. Formally, it was uh, the, the, the question of boosting came up because of uh, an observation that came up uh, right almost right after the theory of fact learning was uh, proposed. Imagine that you have a learning algorithm, and I'm going to call that learning algorithm a, a, a sound fact algorithm if it actually satisfies those uh, uh, properties that we just call fact learning. So for any distribution over the example, and for every error and for every confidence uh, one minus delta, using only a polynomial number of examples, your learning algorithm that I called a strong fact, uh, fact algorithm will produce a hypothesis whose error is less than epsilon. And it does so with uh, you know guarantee of one minus delta. Meaning in one minus delta, if you run this algorithm like thousands and thousands of times on thousands and thousands of data sets that are randomly sampled, in one minus delta fraction of them, you will this algorithm would have produced a classifier whose error is less than epsilon. The reason I'm calling this a strong fact uh, uh, algorithm is because this is true for any error, for arbitrarily small. If you want an uh, if you want an error uh, of say no more than 0.1, this algorithm will give you. If you want an error no more than 0 0.01, this algorithm will give you a classifier. It might not be not guaranteed, but uh, not hundred percent guarantee, but one minus delta guarantee. If instead of point zero one is too high for you, let's make it ten power minus ten. No problem. This algorithm will work. Ten power minus a million. This algorithm will work. So no matter what your error target is, this algorithm will give you a classifier um, whose error is less than that. Of course, you may need a large number of examples, a polynomial number of examples, but polynomial in one over delta, one over epsilon. This is not, no different from what we just looked at uh, and called it. We called it uh, pack, pack learning. Right? This is essentially uh, that this concept class is pack learnable. This algorithm is a pack algorithm. Now let me introduce another idea, something called a weak pack algorithm. The weak pack algorithm is essentially this: it does the same thing, but it does not operate for all possible errors. It does so only for error uh, less more than one minus half minus some gamma for some small gamma. So, for instance, if gamma is 0 0.01, uh, your the weak pack algorithm will give you a classifier whose error is no more than half minus 0 0.01, which is 0 0.49. It cannot give you an arbit a classifier whose error is arbitrarily small. It can give you a classifier whose error is maybe slightly better than chance. If 50% uh, of your examples are plus and minus, then half minus a tiny number is something close to half. So your error is not half, but very close to half. It's slightly, this algorithm is guaranteed to be a weak performer. It will give you a classifier on any data set. It will give you a classifier whose error is slightly better than tossing a coin. Yes. 
the error epsilon should be less than. You're right. So, so we have these two kinds of uh, 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 pack algorithms, strong and weak. And given this definition of a weak pack algorithm, in 1988, uh, Michael Kant and Lovely Valiant in a paper, they asked, does weak learnability imply strong learnability? In other words, if you have a concept class for which I can invent a weak pack learning algorithm, it gives me a classifier whose error is no more than uh, uh, it is slightly better than chance. Does this mean that this concept class is uh, pack learnable in the strong sense? Now, this is interesting. It might be easier for me to invent a weak learning algorithm because I don't have to do too much work. I might just be able to, you know, just use these heuristics and construct rules of thumb and get a weak learner. But maybe if I have to invent a strong Pack learning algorithm, I might have to think hard and it's just not going to, it's non trivial. So, the motivation for this question is can I leave the problem of constructing a strong pack learning algorithm to someone else, to a theorem, and instead focus my effort on constructing this weak algorithm? Because if that works, then my weak algorithm can somehow be boosted to produce a strong algorithm. So does weak learnability imply strong learnability? And this was in 1988. Just to kind of put this uh, in context, the concept of PAC was defined in 1984 by Leslie Valiant. Michael Kearns was his PhD student. So this was essentially part of his PhD dissertation. Okay. So then this was in 1988. And then uh, very quickly in 1989, one year later, Rob Shapir took the challenge up. And he was able to prove that boosting can be done. This was the first provable boosting algorithm where he called the weak learner three times on three slightly modified distributions of the data, constructed a model, and then repeated this process again and again. It's a somewhat involved process, but it, this is, it was not efficient, but it was at least theoretically doable. This paper was able to prove that strong learnability, weak learnability implies strong learnability. And uh, uh, almost simultaneously, your friend uh, in 1990 sh showed up an optimal algorithm that uh, does slightly better. Uh, they teamed, and in 92, there were some initial experiments, but it didn't really work in practice. And then in 95, uh, uh, Freund and Shapir teamed up and they introduced this algorithm called Adipus, which had two things. It built on all the work that came before and it was, uh, uh, it kind of, proved constructively that weak learnability implies strong learnability. In addition, it gave an algorithm that was actually practical. If you can actually use it and uh, it works in practice. In fact, it's uh, if we had another maybe three months in the semester, I might even have a homework question asking you to implement this. But if you have three months in the semester, there will be a lot more homeworks than that. Um, Adboost was quickly followed by a huge number of papers that apply and also practical applications. And a little while later, Freund and Shapir got a Godel Prize for that. So it's kind of, it's a nice uh, body of work that is coherent and uh, uh, also it turns out rather accessible. All right, that's just the introduction to what is boosting. I'm not going to talk about Adboost. Uh, Adboost is an algorithm that we will look at that actually does this boosting. And uh, so we'll start with Adaboost in the next lecture and then continue from there into general ensembles. And if time permits, we will start support vector machines on Tuesday. Tuesday? No. Thursday. Yes, today is Tuesday. Yes, on Thursday. All right. I'll see you on Thursday.